because they are uh, slightly traffic. So uh, for this, we will uh, we will start. Uh, thank you for for being here uh, on the first meetup of the first and the only uh, Scrum Alliance uh, in uh, Romania. Um, for this uh, for this meeting. Uh, we have uh, something interesting to, to talk about and uh, we have Bob here that will uh, present us. Uh, Bob is uh, a certified enterprise coach, a safe program consul consultant and a certified agile leadership educator. Um, Bob, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, so you can start. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. It's my pleasure. I want to thank uh, Danute and Amir for um, inviting me, and uh, it's a pleasure in kicking things off. Um, so we're going to do a talk this evening. I'm going to get a, give you a, a little bit of a presentation, but then we're going to get a chance to do some practice as well, which uh, is important to me. Uh, the, the topic tonight is why the world needs more prescriptive Agile coaches. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by prescriptiveness in, in a little bit. Uh, so we can just get started. Um, I'm not going to talk at all about me. Uh, I just have some certifications, uh, things like that. Uh, I collect potato heads. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, but my team, I have my team behind me, which is potato heads. I don't know if you're familiar with potato heads. Uh, in Europe, but I collect them. And this is my favorite potato head. It's Darth Tater, not Vader, but Tater. So um, I, I just like to uh, start kick things off and give a, an acknowledgement to the potatoes. Uh, enough of that silliness. So when I say coach, in this case, it's a broad definition. I'm not trying to disagree with the scrum uh, guide or agree with the scrum guide or anything. When I say coach, I'm implying you could be in one of the following roles. Uh, and this isn't uh, an exhaustive list. Uh, you could be a scrum master. You could be a formal coach. You could be a manager of a team uh, or a team leader. You could be a senior leader. Uh, you could be a project manager. And the list sort of goes on. It can go on. Uh, virtually anyone who is guiding an agile transformation, who's helping have discussions with people and helping guide them from wherever they're at to more agile mindsets uh, would be a coach from my point of view. Um, when I say prescriptive, um, I mean it's it's making, so I'll give you a, 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 descri a, 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 descri a description. Uh, it's making or giving direction, rules, or injunctions. So that's sort of a definition. It's sanctioned by long-standing usage or custom. It's derived from a legal prescription, meaning a prescriptive title. Uh, when I say prescriptive, in this case, you're adopting a coaching stance where you're telling people, you're, you're more strongly telling people what to do, if that makes sense. If you, if you see a team member uh, making a mistake or you want to uh, provide some advice, you strongly provide that advice. You strongly are telling them what to do. Um, the notion for this, for this talk is too prescriptive versus too soft. One of the things that I think is a lot of coaches, at least here in the U.S., I'm not sure how it, it surfaces in, in Europe, is a lot of coaches are soft. They ask powerful questions. They take a very soft stance, and they really don't help the team sometimes. Uh, they, they let the team struggle sometimes by themselves or individuals struggle. Uh, so the reason that I'm, I'm, I put this presentation together is sort of look for just right. Uh, there's the three bears of just right. So there's too prescriptive, there's too soft, and I'd like us to end up somewhere in the middle so that we're not, we're not yelling at people, but we're not sort of avoiding the tough conversations as well, but we're somewhere in between. Uh, so one side is too prescriptive. So you're excessively telling people what to do. Uh, it's, it's a military stance. So in the military, I, I fortunately or unfortunately was in the U.S. military for three years and everyone yelled at me. So for the first six months, 
I, you know, I thought my name was some swear words, some juicy words. I lost my name, Bob, and I was called other things all the time. So excessively telling, closed-minded, there's one way to do things. Uh, basic tactics are focused on uh, scrutiny, fast feedback. So two, so one side of the dimension is very prescriptive behavior where you're telling people that they're, they made a wrong, they, they've made a mistake. Um, if anyone in the room has ever said, uh, that's not the way Scrum, I, I, I can't see a show of hands, but the Scrum guy doesn't say to do it that way, or Agile is supposed to be done this way, or uh, you didn't read the book. I'm telling you, Scrum should be, you should do a stand up this way. You should ask the three questions. If you've ever had language like that in a coaching stance, that's pretty, that's fairly prescriptive language. Anyone ever do that? I've done that. I've, I've sort of referenced the agile books and things, and I've used it as a, as a club to sort of beat people into submission or to try to. Uh, so that's prescriptiveness. On the other side is too soft. You never ever will tell anyone that they're making a mistake. You'll never ever tell anyone, you'll never give them advice. You'll, they have to discover it on their own. So if they don't discover it, you won't tell them. There's a myriad of ways of doing things. Uh, it's more for advanced teams. Context matters. Uh, there's a mindset of let's see how it goes or discover. It's very fail friendly. So on this side, you know, you're, you're very, very sort of, you're very soft. You're just an advisor. Uh, and even if the team asks you, hey, what do you want, what do you think we should do? You deflect that away. So that would be the other side of very soft. Um, there's a gentleman, Doc on Dev, who has a, um, a, uh, a blog, and this gives you an, an example of maybe prescriptiveness. So the coach, may I give you some feedback on your stand-ups? The client, sure, that would be great. Coach, I've noticed you don't address the three questions in your stand-ups, but I think you'll find the stand-up to be of higher value if you did. The client, oh, we tried that. It felt really disconnected. This way it feels more like a team. Well... Coach, I don't know if you've read the book on Scrum, but the stand-up serves a very specific and important purpose. It's important to have, in order to maximize the benefit, uh, what will be done and any impediments. Let's tell the team we're improving the format and start with the three questions on Monday. Sound good? So that gives you an example of a dialogue. That, to me, would be a prescriptive dialogue uh, that we're really strongly sort of influencing the teams what to do. Make sense so far? I hope so. Um, so I'm going to do some setup stuff and then we're going to practice. Um, now I'm changing directions a little bit and I want to talk about coaching context. Uh, you have to be very context or you don't have to do anything, but I think, I think it's good to consider your context when you're coaching and there's different aspects of, of context. One of them is what have you done before? So I, I personally don't think of a coaching conversation as being one conversation. Rarely have I had a coaching conversation and I had a miraculous result in one conversation. Usually the coaching is a series of conversations and there's a journey that you go on with either a team or with individuals or, or leaders, organizations as you're coaching. So what steps have you taken before? Uh, maturity comes into way. If you've ever heard, how many people have ever heard of Shuhari? Probably all of you have heard of Shuhari. Hands, Shuhari. Shuhari is a maturity model. Uh, it's a metaphor that's talking about. So team maturity or individual maturity, not not sort of age maturity, but but agile maturity comes into play. A uh, culture comes is, is is a part of context and norms. Uh, business, the business that you're in. If you're in a financial organization, that's a that's a specific context. It has regulatory concerns. Uh, there's security concerns. That's part of your context. Team, your skill, your skill as a coach is a concern is a context. And then the organizational support for agility. Uh, the other part of your coaching scenario is you want to be cognizant of directional. You want to have directional awareness. So am I coaching down? Am I coaching up? Am I coaching peers? Uh, am I doing all of that at the same time, depending on the situation? So context, in the back of your mind, you want to be thinking about context. One of the best tools I want you to take this away from this session is a lot of people, they think that coaching is in this area. There's one stance for coaching. And 
one, one of the reasons I like this model is it gives us permission to move around the model. And I want us to be adept in our coaching. So for example, down here is more prescriptive and up here is less. So if I'm less, I'm, I might be a counselor or a facilitator or a coach. You did well, you can add this next time. So I'm just making some lightweight suggestions. Uh, I'm a sounding board here, so I'm really just listening. I'm, I'm not really reacting. So if I'm a counselor, I'm really just listening to the situation. Or if I'm a facilitator, I'm facilitating a container for folks. Those are stances. I can adopt those stances as a coach. So to me, these nine sort of stances are part of coaching. Uh, if I want to be more prescriptive, I could come down here and, for example, I can adopt a modeler stance where I will show people what to do. I will do it so you can watch and learn from me as in I have expertise. Or I will do it for you and I will tell you what to do. That hands-on expert is another very prescriptive stance. Or a technical advisor. I'll answer your questions as you, as you go along. So I'm providing direct guidance. One of the stances I like in the middle is that of a teacher sort of middle ground is a teaching stance where I'm, here are some principles, I'm sharing principles, I'm teaching folks. I, I'm, I'm close to showing them, but I'm not. I'm close to modeling, but I'm not directly modeling. In any coaching session, I find that a lot of folks, if I'm soft, I might just stay here. I might just stay in this region as a counselor facilitator. That would be less prescriptive, but sometimes the team may need something else. Let's say I have a very immature team and they really need to be told what to, they're not finding the, the way on their own or a, an immature individual. And if I stay here, I may never help them as a coach or it may, they may struggle greatly. Whereas if I'm having that coaching conversation, I may come out of coach, counselor and facilitator, and I may come down to hands-on expert or I may come down to technical advisor or modeler. In the same conversation, I may, be, I may start out as a counselor and I'm listening to what's going on and then I make an adjustment and I say, you know, in, in my head, I'm like, you know, they really need my help, so let me switch to hands-on expert. And then I might come back to teaching so I can move around. I, I'm not suggesting that you adopt all nine stances in one coaching conversation but it's useful not to stay in one place. And I find that a lot of, a lot of coaches sort of stay, stay on the less prescriptive side. So the model is, is I, th I found it to be very useful. I wanted to talk a little bit about Shuhari because our coaching is really dependent on Shuhari, uh, which is the maturity of the team. So Shu is a novice or a beginner. And, and that's that typical, and it's an Aikido model. So a shoe needs a lot more coaching. So if I go back to this model, if I can go back, if I'm, co if, if I'm coaching a shoe team, okay, yes. Yes. Was there a question? No. No, no not from here. Okay, cool. So if I'm coaching a shoe team, I might want to stay here. If I'm coaching a re team, I probably want to go in here or a ha team. And if I'm coaching a really expert team, I probably want to be less prescriptive. So not getting stuck on the boxes. It, the, if I'm a shoe team, I want to be more prescriptive and a re team, ha team, I want to go in this direction. So the maturity of the team is one of those sort of drivers or those decision factors, context decision factors that I want to make as a coach. And I want to move around. I want to be nimble in what I'm doing. I want to switch gears again, and I want to talk about there are these books. Uh, there's this notion of having a crucial conversation. And what I found is a lot of people, uh, again, this is probably in the States more. I, I can't speak to Europe, and I think it's cultural in different areas of Europe. Uh, but I see it in, in Asia Pacific as well is folks don't like to, t coaches avoid the hard conversations. Uh, and, cr and one of the reasons they do that is they're not skilled. An another reason they do that is because it takes a tremendous amount of energy sometimes to have a hard conversation. 
And it's much easier to avoid the conversation or to hint around the conversation rather than to go to the center of the conversation. So crucial conversations is a wonderful tool or a model or a framework for having those conversations. Uh, but I think a lot of people avoid it. From a leadership perspective, I have a view that Pareto, the Pareto principle rules here, that only 20% of the leaders are willing to give 80% of the, the hard feedback. So it's not just coaches that avoid these conversations, but it's often the leaders that, that avoid those hard conversations as well. Um, and it really matters in an agile context to have those, those, those conversations. Uh, usually when I, when I vet this, uh, it, this is the sort of the elevator pitch uh, or the essence of uh, crucial conversations. And it's the one thing. And I'll let you read it just, just briefly. Hopefully you can see it and you can read it. And the way I like to explain this is we're at a crossroads as a communicator, as a coach, very often we get, uh, let's say I pick on Amir. I don't know if Amir is there, but I'm going to pick on him anyway. So Amir is there and um, Amir works. I'm coaching Amir and Amir is hot headed and he scares me as a coach and he often yells at me and, uh, and he's not respectful all the time. It, and this doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough that for any hard conversation, I've been avoiding these conversations with Amir. And suddenly I've noticed that he, in his team, he's taking a very dominant stance as, in his team. He's dominating the designs of his team. He's dominating the technology. It, there's 10 people on his team, but Amir is the one voice that is overpowering his entire team. And I'm the scrum master of that team. And I've had some run-ins with, with Amir in the past. So what I'm doing is I need to have a crucial conversation with him as the scrum master to coach him away from that behavior. Uh, so I'm at a crossroads. Do I have that conversation or do I find a hundred reasons why not to? They're really excuses. Do I have the conversation even though he's going to scare? And when he scares me, I sometimes forget my words and I sometimes get, I get nervous. And so it, it might not be the best conversation. So do I have a non-best conversation with Amir and a coaching conversation, or do I avoid it? Do I have it even though it may be awkward, or do I avoid it? And that's crucial conversations. And the answer is, everyone in the room, which way do we go? Have it or avoid it? Have it or avoid it? What do you think? Have it. Have it. Have it. Have it. Have it. Yeah. But I want. But I want. But he scares me. He scares me. He makes, I, and I stutter, I lose my train of thought. It's like if I was coaching Donald Trump, it, he scares me. And so it, it would be very, so have it. So crucial conversations say have it, but get better at it. It says have it. Now it gives you a framework for it, but what it, what it, find, what it turns out is a lot of people, they don't have the courage for it. It's one of those, those scrum characteristics that we talk about, those key principles of scrum. One of them is courage is it, the crucial conversations is saying, have the courage to have it. Step into the conversation. Yes, get better over time, but it's much better to have it, uh, even if it's mediocre, than to avoid it and never have that conversation. And, and human nature, a lot of human nature is to avoid those conversations, okay? So again, as coaches, we wanna step into these conversations. We wanna step in, we wanna have them. So I'll give you a, a conversational model. It's a simple model for is chess based. Uh, and I find it very useful. You've probably already done, you're probably already using something like this. I just like it. Uh, so I, a coaching conversation has three phases or can have three phases. And again, remember those nine, those nine stances still come into play. We're applying this to those nine stances if we wish. Uh, so opening moves, is the opening of a conversation. Uh, one of the, my favorite things is to ask permission. Can I give you feedback? Can we have this conversation? So before having it, ask the person if you can engage it. Uh, clarify or ask questions or listen. So you're opening the door to the conversation. So you're not just diving in. Very often when we're being prescriptive, we, we skip the opening moves 
and we go right into the problem and we go right into solutions. That's a very common prescriptive sort of direction. Uh, but, but we want to be careful about opening the door. Is this the right time? Do you have time for a conversation? Can I give you some feedback? Can we go to a place and have coffee, et cetera? So that's opening moves. The middle game is where we explore the conversation, where we brainstorm things, we widen the understanding. Uh, we ask some open-ended questions, but then we start talking about options and strategies. We start talking about behavioral ownership. We might start talking about actions. So we're moving, it's, there's sort of a widening at the beginning of, an, an, of, of the middle game where we're, we're discussing lots of things potentially, but then we want to start narrowing in the middle game to get to some conclusions, to get to some actions. And then the end game is closure where we talk about next steps. We might talk about action plans. We might talk about who's going to do what. Uh, we might also talk about we need another conversation at some point. So this is just a nice sort of framework, opening moves, middle game, end game, uh, introductions, sort of exploration, and then closure in action setting. Everyone good with that? Just We're gonna have some conversations, so I'm giving you some tools to think about in your coaching conversations. You don't have to think about all any of them. Um, there's, a, there's a magazine in uh, that's produced by Harvard called Harvard uh, Business Journal or Business Review, HB, HBR. And there was a uh, HBR, um, oops, there was an HBR, boy, that's not working out really well. There we go. There was an HBR uh, article that did a survey of managers. And uh, I, this is just reaffirming the point that we sort of suck at communication and we need to get better with it. Uh, and 69% and of managers were intimidated or uncomfortable with communicating to their teams. So this is just reaffirming that point that it's not, we think that communication is something we're really good at. But a lot of people, coaches, leaders, uh, aren't very good at it. And we need to, we, I, I, my assertion is we need to start working on it. We need to start practicing coaching conversation. Uh, a two-day class isn't good enough. We have to practice, 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 scenario-based practice. And we're going to do some of that tonight. I'm going to skip this. This is a story. You can read that. There's a blog post there at the bottom, uh, and you can read that blog post. Um, one of the, the, the essence of the blog post is a lot of times people find whatever excuses. We, we have hundreds of excuses, and I was working with a, a really, really senior, experienced, certified coach, certified trainer, a CST, CEC, and he will remain nameless. I will not name him but we were co-coaching together and he, he was supposed to be coaching up to leaders. And one morning when we were having our coaching stand up, he's like, I don't have the energy for it. Uh, it's, I just don't feel like coaching. They don't get it anymore. So I'm going to stop coaching. And one of the, the conversations he and I had is that's our job. We need to have the courage for it. If we don't have the energy for it, then we need to find another job or maybe we need to get someone else to do the coaching for us. But you need to, we need to step in. No matter how hard it is, we need to step into doing our, our role as a coach. We need to step in to have the conversations. The other part of the story is no matter how experienced you are, it's still you have to light a fire under everyone to, to do it. It's hard to do it. It's intimidating. It takes a lot of energy. And you have to be committed to coaching or committed to having these crucial conversations because it takes so much energy. I want to switch gears again and talk about Lisa Atkins has written a wonderful book uh, and it's based on some coactive coaching uh, work. And she talks about powerful questions. And this is going back to, let me, let me go back here. I, I want to go back to those stances again. So just bear with me. This is really the powerful questions are, are in here. Uh, they're not even teaching. They're counselor slash coach. Probably they're up in here. Is, is very, they're not very prescriptive. So, but they're useful. 
they can be very useful. So powerful questions from a coaching toolkit perspective. They're open-ended. They're not asked with a correct answer in mind. You're trying to ask questions of whoever you're coaching so that they self-discover information, that they, they self-reflect and they self-discover, and they self-problem solve. It invites introspection. It reveals solutions to them. So the, the, the powerful questions open, open the mind of the coachee. Um, almost always lead to greater creativity and send people into discovery. So they're not leading or judgment or closed or tricks. It's really open-ended is the intent. Here's an example of some powerful questions. Uh, I don't know if you've written the, you, you may have the slides, you may not. If you don't, you just want to, I'm going to stay here for a little bit and you can sort of think about, like, what have you tried so far? Uh, what do you really want it to be? Uh, what is at risk? What might help look like? So if someone's asking for help, but they, you don't know, you want them to discover specifically what it is, you might ask that open-ended question. What is stopping you? Uh, what part is not yet clear? Uh, when is it time for action? If someone isn't taking action, when would be the time? Uh, what's important about that? What else? What else? What else do you see? What else is the problem? And so you're you're asking these powerful questions in order from a coaching stance perspective to explore things with folks. It's actually very it's a very good technique no matter no matter what stance you're in in the nine stances to ask some open ended questions and then actively listen. So one of the dangers when you're asking powerful questions is you don't want to answer them yourself. So you want to you want to ha ask powerful open-ended questions, but then you want to shut up and actively listen and be quiet and actively listen. Sometimes you even want to let silence, let, let ask the question, and it might take 15 seconds or 30 seconds or even a minute for someone to start talking. So you, but you don't want to necessarily fill the silence. You want to allow that to happen. That, that, that really can put some pressure and sort of induce the conversation. So what I've done so far is I've given you some coaching advice, some coaching sort of, we've talked about context, we've talked about crucial conversations, we've talked about courage, we've talked about prescriptiveness and non-prescriptiveness, uh, powerful questions, uh, the chess model uh, for conversations, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to, to give you some tools for having these. The next thing I wanna do is let me set the stage. So I hope everyone has a handout. Does everyone have a handout? Yes? No? Yes? Not yet. Not Sorry. yet? Yep, yep. Okay, good. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna set you up for the next step, and I want everyone to sort of, so you're gonna get a handout. Don't read it, listen to me, don't read it. Just, just hold on to it. And, li and listen to me for a little bit. So what we're going to do is I've given you a handout with about 20 coaching scenarios. They're little vignettes that are coaching situations. I want you to break into groups of three. Uh, you must Three or four, preferably three. Uh, groups of two don't work and groups of 20 don't work. So it's either three, or if we have an odd for person, uh, then four. Uh, there's going to be three roles in the group. One person is going to be the coach. So get, if you're gonna read that, you're gonna read the scenario and you're going to react to it, and it's gonna be pretty obvious who the coach is. The coach is maybe a scrum master. And in some scenarios, there might be a team leader who's not playing well with the team. So that would be the coachee. So the coach in one scenario would be scrum master would turn be the coach. That would be one role. And the coach E would be the team member. And then the observe, there's also a third role of a scribe or a note keeper, a facilitator, uh, an observer. So there's three roles in the triad. It's a coaching dojo. Uh, if you've done dojos before, they're probably similar to this. So the coach, the coachee, and you have to find them, tease them from, from the scenario, 
and then the observer. And the observer is an important role because they're facilitating, they're taking notes. The observer is going to actually run the retrospective. At the end of the coaching conversation, there will be a little, a small mini retro where the observer, the facilitator, drives the, con the discovery conversation in the triad. Everyone good so far. So that's, we're going to break into groups of three and um, we're going to practice, we're going to practice that. Um, what else do I want? We're going to, you don't have to pick my scenarios. You could also pick one from your work. So I'm just giving you some scenarios to sort of get your juices flowing, to get the momentum going. I want to go through some of the scenarios just to talk about them. So if you open it up to page two, the first one is, I'll, I'll just read a few, just to kind of help you interpret the scenarios. So you notice a team not getting their work done in each sprint. 30 to 40% carryover work is occurring. What's even sadder is that they are forced to uh, expose this, and the carryover trends seem to be increasing. So carryover stories. So the coachee in this case would be someone representing the team. So you, so I, to me, I would, the coachee would be representing a team voice. And the coach in this case could either be the scrum master or an independent agile coach who's trying to coach the team. Everyone with me. So those are the two sides. If we go to uh, scenario three, you've noticed that many of your fellow scrum masters have dropped team retrospectives. They promise to pick them up when there is more time. Is this a great form of inspect and adapt or something else? What to do? So in this case, you're a scrum master that's holding retrospectives dear and your peers are not. So you can either coach, you're going to be a scrum master coaching your peers, either as a group of scrum masters or individually. You can pick either one. Everyone with me. So the coach is a scrum master who's holding to the principles and the coachee is a scrum master who's not holding to the principles. All right. Uh, scenario five, you're the scrum master. This is more clear. You're the scrum master of a team who has recently adopted scrum. One team member is really struggling to work within the team. So they're not, they're not playing well within the team. They're not adopting teamwork. Uh, so this would be scrum master to team member. It's pretty straightforward. This would be scrum master coach to team. Uh, and, and, um, Danute, could you do me a favor? Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Would you mind, in order for people to get a feeling for this, would you mind coaching with me on scenario five for just a few minutes, like role playing? Could you be the scrum master? Mm. Could you be the scrum master and I'll be the team member, please? <laughs> can can we do okay. that? Yeah, one second. Let me just read it once again. Cool. Only a few minutes, but I want to give everyone an impression of what should happen. I, I want to give some, you know, just some guidance. So don't look at A. It's just the primary number five. Okay. You ready? You're the scrum master. I'm the uh, team member. And since you're the coach, you have to start. So go ahead. Okay. So uh, I've seen that you are um, a little bit um, annoyed. And uh, you, tell, you told me that uh, you want to talk with me. Uh, can we have this uh, this conversation? And can you can you tell me what uh, what is this about? Oh, uh, sure, we could have this conversation. This is, uh, but I'm not annoyed. Uh, I'm doing great. I love this. I I like this team. I mean, I'm doing all the work, uh, and and I'm carrying okay. the team. I'm carrying the team on my back, so they're a little heavy, but I'm not annoyed okay. at all. I'm I'm used to doing all the hard work. Okay, so um, you you are doing all the work, and uh, what am I seeing that uh, that you are telling me now is that um, do you believe that your team members should do more, 
or what do you believe that uh, that they are not uh, not doing right now? I mean, they're okay. Uh, they try hard. Like bless, you know, they're sort of like children. They're they're sort of they're trying to do the best they can. Uh, what I wish is they just get out of my way. I mean, they can help me. They can get me coffee and they can help me. Uh, but they need to sort of they need to support me because I'm like I said. Uh, I think we have a velocity of 25 points, yes? 25 points per sprint. Yeah. I'm producing about 20 points per sprint, 20 to 22 points per sprint. So I'm doing most of the work. So if they can just support me, I think I think the sprints will be good. Okay. Have you have you tried to to talk with them? Uh, do you did you get any any answers from them until now, or uh, this is the the first time you you want to talk about this? Is this the first print where uh, where we are seeing this uh, from uh, from their side? So again, I'm going to stop. I think you're you may be misinterpreting <laughs> it. So I'm the team. I am a bad team member with a big ego. You with me? You are the and I'm affecting the team. Yeah. I, I wanted to see what what you are telling me about yourself. I, I, hope I'm I, hope, I hope I'm reflecting my big ego. Okay, have, so I'll go back. I'll go back. Uh, have I talked to the team? Yeah, yeah. I, talk, I mean, we have lunch together every day, et cetera, et cetera. You know what? I mean, I'm actually trying to teach them because I have 25 years of experience and they, most of the team members have like two or three years of experience. So I have a lot of experience. I try to share when I can. Okay, so um, can uh, in the <laughs> we can we can stop everyone with me. That was a role play. Everyone good? Role play. That yeah. was a, that was a role play. Uh, I'm not going to critique it. I want you to critique it. Uh, not not this one, but when when you get together. So one of the keys for role plays is to put on the role. So in the States, we have two actors, Robert, De everyone will ever hear of Robert De Niro or Meryl Streep. Yes, Robert De Niro, Meryl Streep. Very good actors. One of the keys to role play is acting. A I was trying to act like my, like the scenario said. Uh, I think Danut was struggling with me a little bit. Uh, he was sort of softer. He could have entered that conversation in another way. I'm not suggesting he was wrong. He could have said, Bob, I've heard, and I'm not suggesting this is the right thing. So that was a soft entry. Everyone with me asking questions. What would, yeah. be, a, what would be a prescriptive entry? Bob, you suck. The entire team hates you. You've been ignorant and arrogant and overbearing, and we need it to stop. What do you think about that? I just, I, I exaggerated, everyone with me. So there's the, the not, there's the soft approach. And then I just came in with a very prescriptive or probably too prescriptive, but that's the dimensions. Then we would have had a conversation and we could have seen how that played out. Okay, so enough of that. I want you to pick a couple scenarios, uh, Oh, I want you to pick one scenario. We're going to time it for 10 minutes. So I want you to break up into groups. Then you're going to pick a scenario, decide coach, coachee, and observer facilitator. Uh, you want to have some paper to take notes if you're the facilitator. You can pick any of my scenarios, any, any that you like. So you can pick. Don't read them too much, but don't overanalyze them. Pick one that you resonate with that you like. Have, a, have about an eight-minute conversation and then a two-minute debrief, a two-minute retro. So about seven, eight minutes of conversation, two-minute retro, and then we're going to come back. I want half the room. I'm seeing half the room. Everyone with me. I'm, I'm drawing a line in the middle of the room. Everyone to the left of me. I want you to start the conversation prescriptively. Does everyone understand what I mean? Prescriptively. <laughs> with you know not a lot of coaching stance more harsh direct feedback i want everyone to the right to start softly so left half, roughly half the room 
half the dojos, I want you to start prescriptive. Half the dojos, I want you to start soft and then see where you end up. Everyone good with that? It's just a starting position. So form your dojos, pick your scenarios. I'm gonna start my clock and in 10 minutes we'll stop and I'll see and we'll debrief what, 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 what happened and we'll see if we wanna do it again, okay? You're on.
dajcie Cię w
Okay, if everyone, what I'd like is have the facilitator, so start closing the co coaching conversation, and what I want to have is a retro for about two minutes or so, have the observer facilitator do a retro. What did they observe? How, what happened? How could you improve it? What would be better strategies? So go from conversation to the, to the retro, please. I will speak by saying that the next part is if I want to. Sounded, I can tell, I couldn't understand you, but it sounded like there were some good conversations going. So that's exactly what I was hoping yep. for. So that was one dojo, scenario-based, three roles, simulating a hard conversation. The most important thing is the role play, having particularly for the person who is the coachee, to, for them to be realistic in their role 
And uh, the other important role is the facilitator. Actually, the facilitator can even interrupt the conversation. Like for example, if the conversation is going in the wrong direction, the facilitator can time out and suggest a direction change. You with me? So that's one of the things that when I was, when I was simulating with Danute, I, we didn't have a facilitator and they could have interrupted. I was actually doing that too, that role too. The facilitator can time out and say, oh, you're not role playing enough. Or they can time out and say, you're role playing too much. You're overacting. You're underacting. You're overacting. You need to change that. Uh, you had too much opening moves. You want to move into the middle game. So the facilitator is, can be a little more active than just a note taker uh, if they want to be, if they want to be. So what I'd like you to do, it's going to be hard to debrief. So what I'd like to not, I don't want to debrief between, I, would everyone be able to do one more session? Would that be okay? One more? Okay, I'll take that. I'll take that as a yes. You need to rotate the roles. So the coach cannot coach again. So in your so in your doja in your triad, I want the roles to rotate. So someone take on a new role, get a new scenario, a new role, based on your uh, retrospective feedback. Maybe make adjustments and then do it again. But I still want half the room to be prescriptive and half the room to be non-prescriptive to start. That's just how you start. You can end up somewhere else. Go for it. You have 10 minutes. Uh, you can either choose a scenario or you can create your own. <laughs> so I cannot be the coach again because I've been already. Okay, you guys, you are the coach. You are the coach. You have any respect? The one you like. Do you want to make uh, our own scenario? Maybe we can make yeah, more, uh, more, yeah, more liberal. Yeah, well, I'm not so long into it. If you have a nice scenario, but we can make it. Yeah, we can. <laughs> One we had uh, number five was so, uh, very uh, common uh, situation.
if you don't mind, uh, it might be in your favor. What I did uh, also uh, notice is that your position in the team is very strong. You're a good uh, engineer, this year. but uh, I also see that you are very much updating uh, with the events uh, in the team. They're very strong in your opinion. So basically, sometimes lose uh, might be the
Okay, so you want to start, you want to start doing the retro again, so move from conversation to retro and have, and talk about improvement, talk about what happened, but also talk about improving the conversation the next time. Okay. Okay. conversations if you want to and you can de normally I debrief it meaning I, I want to get like sort of feedback but I think that'll be difficult so what I'd like to do is I'll close it with just some of final comments 
and encouragement, and then I'll uh, say goodbye, and then I'll let you all sort of, you can all talk about it for a few minutes, or you can just run for the doors and go home. So for, the first thing I wanted to talk about is I want to use my daughter. My daughter is a social worker, and she works in New York and Baltimore, so big cities in the United States, and she does family social work with troubled families, families who are, all, you know, some of the, the mothers are on drugs, and she does, sometimes she has, you know, she works with the children, and she is a director of a large so, social work team. And so this, these people, if we think we have hard conversations in Agile, my daughter has 10 times harder conversations in the real world with really challenging situations out in the city. And one of the things that the social workers do is they practice their conversations. They do dojos uh, and they practice them a lot. And before they go into a certain situation, they will practice a variety of situations. Like what happens if it goes well? What happens if it goes poorly? What happens if it's in the middle? What happens if someone gets angry? What happens if they're, they're passive aggressive? And they'll go through different scenarios to diffuse it. They're preparing themselves. Uh, they're practicing their conversation. So they don't just walk in. They, they don't walk into a, what they think of as a, as a challenging conversation and without any practice, even though, even if they have 10 years of experience or 15 years of experience. So they get a lot of traction out of dojos in situational conversations and practicing. And that's exactly what I think, I'm, why I'm introducing it. I'm not introducing it just for tonight. I'm hoping that you like this technique. And I think if you wanna become a great coach, you, a great coach requires practice. And not just practice in the real world in the situations, but preparing yourself for what if. Preparing yourself, that's where the role play can be very powerful, is if you're having a, a scenario in your company, and if I'm role playing the VP, I want to role play as close to the VP's personality as I can to prepare the coach for that, that healthy conversation, for a powerful conversation. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I was trying to get at is come at it from a prescriptive versus non-prescriptive is thinking on your feet and moving around. Sometimes prescription is the right direction. Sometimes it's not. Then you need to shift in the conversation. So situational awareness, thinking on your feet, is that's, again, the practice can help you with that. Um, very often, I'd like to see coaches, scrum masters, coaches in an organization form a guild or a community of practice uh, of coaching, and that's how they can coach. Uh, I think great coaches have to coach a lot. If you have ever gone to a scrum gathering or if you've ever gone to some agile conferences, a lot of them have coaches, and there's some coaching clinics or there's coach camps or uh, there's uh, coaching dojos where, they, where you get a chance to coach. And, and I think that's how we become skilled is we have to practice in multiple situations. The other nice thing about it is it's safe. Well, hopefully this was a safe environment tonight where it's safe to make a mistake. It's safe to, to change strategies. So that's actually where the facilitator come in, comes in. The facilitator is coaching the coaching conversation and really helping sort of in in strategies you tried that strategy why don't we try a different strategy why don't we try with more open-ended questions you tried being prescriptive let's try not doing that etc see if that's more effective see what happens if you go down that path etc so that's where the facilitator role is is crucial in this is they really are coaching the coaches if you will um, the other thing, what uh, I want to have the hard conversation. So I gave you some scenarios, but if you're doing dojos in the real world, you want to, they really don't want to be scenarios. They want to be what's happening in your job. They want to be things that you can actually be practicing before. So challenges on the job. And that can, again, it can be up, it can be out, or it can be down, or it can be all of those. So you want to practice that. The final thing is have fun with it. I, I heard some laughter. And, and so there should be joy in coaching as well, or there should be some fun in learning how to be, how to think on your feet. So I heard some laughter and that's exactly, it should be, it should be some fun. You should have some fun in the role play. I actually really enjoy overacting. So it gives me a chance 
when I'm doing dojos, it gives me a chance to overreact. And then usually the facilitator sort of helps me stop overreacting. They, and they change directions. Uh, so I wanted to give you some tools and I wanted to give you a practice container called coaching dojos that I think can be very effective. And that was really all I wanted to share tonight. Uh, I, and what I'd like to do is encourage you to talk about it amongst you. So what did you learn tonight? I would like to encourage you to stay around for a few minutes and talk amongst yourselves about how you might use this in your job. So it's not about this meeting. It's about how can you use this to become a more effective coach, communicator in the real world? Because it's such a hard thing to do. These are hard conversations to have. Uh, good. All right. So I'd like to say thank you. And I'd like to close, but I, I'm going to go away, but I'd like to allow you to have some conversations. I'd like to encourage you to have some conversations. Uh, Danute and Amir, are we, can we close? Yes, yeah. we can close. Thank you very much, Bob, for being here. And everyone for, give uh, me, how, how did this feel? Was it okay with everyone? Good. I hope you had some fun with it. Please use it. We need better. Co we need we need more great coaches in the world. We need more great conversations to have. So have a great evening, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.